Neat Nation, welcome back to the Droopy Whiskey Show. Another Monday, another new video. You're welcome. Just got out of the shower, so my hair might do some interesting things throughout the video. Um, it, it is untamable without using an inordinate amount of oil-based product. We're not here to talk about my hair. As fun as that would be, uh, we're here to talk about whiskey. Specifically today, we're going to talk about the most disappointing, that's the word I chose, the most disappointing whiskeys that I had. These are not necessarily the worst whis whiskeys that I've had. In fact, many of them are far from it. Like, still good whiskeys, but disappointing, given either A, what I hoped they would be, maybe that's on me, or B, what they were hyped to be. And I just flat disagree. Or three, I guess, three reasons. What well, they could have been. So much potential. Okay. Well, first, let me just pour some whiskey here. What am I drinking today? I'm drinking a little rare breed rye. This is one where it seems like a new batch was made and is now circulating. This is the first one. I've been letting it sit for a little while. Coming back to it tonight. Giving it some air time. Solid nose on this one. Second thing, make sure you guys get down in the show notes below for links and um, you know more content that you might enjoy. This is a list video. I'm going to throw a couple other list videos down in the comments below that I think you'll dig for sure. Subscribe to the channel, my channel, and then my friend Brian Bikey's channel over at Abandoned Bourbon. Brian and I do live streams Thursday. Last Thursday was awesome as we broke down alternatives for the Buffalo Trace Antique Collection. Are there any real ones? And I think we came up with a, a good list. It's like an hour and a half long to get through our list, but a lot of good whiskeys got shout outs. So I highly recommend you check that out. Just for you, I'll throw the link in the show notes below. Per usual, please help me out by like, commenting, and subscribing on this video. That would be sick. Now let's get in to what I think are the most disappointing whiskeys I've ever tasted. Whiskey number one, if you are uh, not new to the channel, this is not gonna be a surprise to you. You've heard me talk about this whiskey. I tasted it during my journey through craft whiskey tastings. I had actually almost bought a bottle of this because I thought that the bottle style was quite cool. And this was a single barrel. There was a barrel proof version as well. I liked the branding. I thought, how bad could it be? 50 bucks, 60 buck price point. But when I received a sample of a Bower Hill single barrel, it was one of the most disappointing whiskeys to me because it actually is one of the worst bourbons I've ever tasted. I just was so surprised at how medicinal it tasted. It's like leaving aspirin in your mouth. Not a lot of sweetness, just bitter, off-putting. Yuck. Like it uh, didn't spend enough time in the barrel, but it also kind of was like what was going into the barrel tasted like it maybe wasn't made real good. Like, if I drank a lot of it, I'd kind of be concerned that it might negatively impact my health. Now, I, I can't say that. I, like, I don't want to be rude to the people who distilled it, um, although I think I just kind of was a little bit. But to me, kind of go back to the drawing board. Like, if I'm making something like that and trying to take it to a competitive market where a lot of craft distilleries are making some really good stuff, I'm not winning with what's in the Bower Hill bottle right now. So... Maybe a few steps back, rethink a few things, give it another four years or whatever. Just don't keep going with what you got. Second most disappointing whiskey. Not that these are in any particular order. I mean, they're actually starting out to more like, oh yeah, that's definitely one that's probably disappointing. And we're going to move to what I think are more uh, shockers, maybe dark horses in the wrong way. Anyway, the second whiskey I'm going to mention tonight is from Smooth Ambler. Now, Smooth Ambler built a name for themselves doing the Old Scout, sourcing MGP. This was back in the day, five years ago. Uh, this was bottled in 2016, so yeah, five years ago, when there was well-aged MGP to be had. And they were one of the first brands to really source it and blow up doing it. But when they moved out of the initial sourcing of MGP, started this transition, they created a bottle, a brand that's still around, called Contradiction. 
and it was a blend of rye and weeded bourbon. And uh, I did not like it one bit. I loved the seven-year-old scouts that I had, and some of the American whiskey single barrels were fine. I mean, those never blew me away, but, you know, fine. But then I got Contradiction, and it was just like, what is happening? It wasn't near the, like, gut-wrenching um, impact on the palate that, say, the Bower Hill had. But it was one of the most confusing, bizarre whiskeys I've had, and showed, you know, a little bit of where we were headed with Old Scout's Sorry, Smooth Ambler's own distillate. Not a good direction thus far. And we're still not seeing a lot of success or praise being given over to Smooth Ambler products, their own distillate, which is kind of a bummer because they did such a good job sourcing and releasing MGP stuff, uh, but haven't exactly crushed it with their own, own juice. So much so that they tried to source Dickel. Now they're back to releasing five-year-old MGP as old scout that's not as good so i mean it's really a bummer like pretty much the smooth ambler narrative is disappointing again i feel like i'm being rude i mean ugh. i apologize if i offend anybody this is my opinion the only whiskey i would say in this list that you shouldn't try is the bower hill because that was really rough otherwise taste for yourself <laughs> Well, we'll keep going. This one I know is actually going to be a little bit of a, a hot take, if you will. But whiskey number three in my list of disappointing whiskeys. Again, won't be a surprise to those of you who are familiar with the channel. But Michter's Toasted Barrel Bourbon. I'm not against Toasted Barrel products. Actually, one of my favorite rides of all time was a pick we did with Starlight which was a double oaked whiskey and double oaks are very similar to toasted and how they tend to like mess with the profile of the whiskey but michter's toasted barrel bourbon from 2018 that was the release i had was so drying like the oak was so unsweet and so palate drying it just yeah i mean given the hype well, I got that one and I was jacked for it because the hype on the 2016 release was pretty high. People loved it. When 2018 dropped, I'm like, oh, peeps are going to be so jealous about my pull here. I got a rare bottle and I opened it at a Droopy Whiskey Night, just having friends over and tasting whiskeys. I was like, guys, let's open a special bottle. So I brought out Michter's Toasted Barrel Bourbon and... Uh, I, I was like, well, dang. <laughs> Sorry, guys. This isn't doing it for me. I want more sweetness. Like, I'm a big fan of sweet oak. I love well-aged whiskeys. But that one was over-oaked. And I like a lot of oak. That one was not coming back. I also have the Michter's Toasted Rye here, which I should have a little something-something little of here compared to this rare breed rye. And it's okay. Like, I like it quite a bit better than the Michter's Toasted Barrel Bourbon. Um, but I was a little skeptical going into the rye after having had the bourbon. So my expectations were slightly lower for this. Still very woody. Like, very woody. But I think two things helped the rye that didn't help the bourbon. That is proof, because the bourbon was like 90-some proof. This rye is barrel strength, so it's 108 proof, and it's a rye. So it's got a little bit more spice to help kind of cut through the intense, almost like dank, not in a good way, <laughs> uh, woody notes uh, that seem to exist in these Michter's Toasted products. So I'm not in a rush to get more of the Michter's Toasted's. Whiskey number four is actually two whiskeys. And that was the limited releases, not limited releases, distillery-only releases launched this year by Heaven Hill. We had the Square Six available at the Evan Williams Bourbon Experience in Louisville. And then we have the four, five brothers. There's five, five Shapiro brothers. The five brothers uh, bourbon at the Bardstown place, whatever they're calling that. Both those sucked. I mean, relative to other Heaven Hill products, Elijah Craig is better. Henry McKenna is better. Markedly. Evan Williams. I dare say, I would almost take Evan Williams Black over what I was tasting in those products. Because Evan Williams Black is fine. And it, 
Evan Williams single barrel is great. Those sucked. I mean, they just were not good. So getting to the trail, I was excited to taste these new releases from Heaven Hill. You'd think that they would do a good job on some of these special products that they're selling in their distillery. No, they're not. My opinion. And to be more specific, like they tasted youngish. Like very, very, very youngish. And not at all what I would expect from, again, Heaven Hill, who has a reputation for aging their whiskeys well. Particularly whiskeys you're going to spend 50 to 60 bucks for. I just expected way more. And I think uh, we all deserve more, actually, from Heaven Hill. Like I would get it from a craft whiskey distillery. I'd be like, oh, these are fine. You know, these are fine whiskeys. But from those folks and what they're asking for these whiskeys is ridiculous. Not winning. Whiskey number five is a uh, whiskey that well, I think we all looked forward to. We were so excited when this whiskey was announced. We all rushed to get our hands on it. And we're willing to pay 80 to 90 to 100 dollars to get one of the Old Forester Barrel Strength Bourbon Picks. Now we all were excited about this because we love Old Forester 1920, we love Old Forester 1910, we love Statesman, we love Birthday Bourbon. I mean Old Forester does, excuse me, they do great things. And uh, I generally like their stuff. I really liked their 90 proof picks. This one is like a banana festival, but it's still good. I drink this one. This one has been hard for me to get through. It's interesting, but my goodness. I think this is probably one of the whiskeys that caused me to start using the term hot as balls. Um, because it is. It just is. It's so freaking hot. If you water it down to 90 proof, it becomes much more palatable. But we're getting a lot of cinnamon notes on these things too. So, which is fine. But if it's very cinnamon forward, it's just not really what I like. I want big sweetness and I like more like rye type flavors than kind of funky cinnamon. So given everything we had from Old Forester, I think this is significantly better than that stuff from Heaven Hill I was talking about. Square Six and Five Brothers. But given the price on this and the hype on these, again, we're just left left wanting a little bit. And that's the general consensus. That's not really a hot take. I don't know many bourbon geeks who are all like, oh, yeah, give me more of the Old Forester barrel strength picks. I don't know a lot of stores still looking for them. I'm actually eager to try the 100 proof picks now because the barrel strength ones are clearly just too much. <laughs> Could benefit with a little water from a little water. Yeah, I mean, it tastes good. Like, it's good, but it's so freaking hot. And it is a lot of, like, cinnamon red hots. A little water in there, mellow it down, bring out that sweetness a little bit more. Bring down the price point, and we're good to go. This would have been a $60 bottle. Still disappointing, but probably wouldn't show up on the list. Given that I paid, like, 80 plus tax, and I, I got it at MSRP, that's where the disappointment comes in. Whiskey number six is uh, probably another hot take, probably one uh, where folks might disagree a little bit, and that's okay. Um, we're all different, palettes are different, but it's another Old Forester product. It's the Old Forester rye, not the barrel strength rye. I think I had one sample of that, enjoyed it. Um, the standard rye, the $22 rye, is that a great value? Yes, it, it definitely is for what seems to be like a four to five year old rye from Ofo. That said, very highly hyped again. Um, you know, Fred Minnick was talking about buying cases. It's his newest favorite is rye. And it was just bubblegum and bananas. Two notes that I'm not big on. If you're a big bubblegum and banana guy with cinnamon, um, yeah, you're going to like it just fine. Not me so much. Like, I was jacked for it hey i finally I've just dropped in wisconsin i'm gonna get it text my boys boys i just found the new ofo rye um would you like me to get you one yeah pick me up one okay walk out with two bottles i open mine and i'm like okay i mean at least it was only 22 bucks so i wasn't disappointed in the value i wouldn't discourage anybody from getting one because i don't think it's bad but the profile's not for me and i think the hype was just ridiculous for what it is all right i've lost count how many whiskeys were on put this ofo back but this is a pretty hot take too 
It's actually the whiskey I started the night with. My first pour. The Rare Breed Rye. Is this bad? No, it's not bad. It's actually good. It's quite good. Nose is really nice. Very lemony and, and spearminty. But it doesn't taste like it spent much time in the barrel. I get next to no oak influence. It reminds me a lot of like 95.5 ryes that are in the six-year-old range. When it came to a rare breed release, I'm expecting we're going to get something, you know, similar in age profile to the rare breed bourbon. Six to eight, maybe some 12-year bourbon in there. But that's got a really like, rich viscosity and plenty of barrel character, which the rare breed rye has none of. So that's the, that's why it was disappointing to me. And that it's hard to get. Like, you think they're going to announce this barrel-proof rye. Yes, yeah, sweet. We're all in on it. That sounds great. And then it tastes like Russell's Reserve Single Barrel Rye at a very comparable proof point, 112.2, slightly above. But it's like, okay, I could just go get Russell's Reserve Single Barrel, which is around more, which I will do in the future. I passed on the Rare Breed Rye multiple times uh, in buying a backup just because I don't really want one. I think there's a lot better ryes out there for the price, which the price is generally 60 to 70 bucks. So again, it's a good rye. It's fine. Like as far as Kentucky ryes go, it's nice. But given what it could have been, um, and given the reputation and taste profile of Rare Breed Bourbon, was expecting a lot more depth and a lot more viscosity, a lot more oak character out of this than what we got. Cornerstone Rye, though, Master's Keep one, that was nice. I like that one. That gave us the oak that is missing in pretty much every Wild Turkey Rye product outside of Cornerstone. They just don't taste like they're left in the barrel very long. Two more. I mean, these are big hot takes, but there's probably consensus on the next one among some of us, and that is Weller 12 uh, is pretty disappointing. Um, that whiskey gets traded above $200 secondary. You know, MSRP is what, 50 or less? Maybe the MSRP has been raised recently, but uh, generally a very low MSRP, but a good age statement, 12 years in a barrel, 90 proof. And it's Weller. I love Weller 107. Well, Weller Special Reserve is, nah, it's like Makers. Um, that's my take. But Weller 12, I'm expecting a profile that is advanced beyond the 107. Granted, it's lower proof, but it's given us three-ish, four-ish more years on average in the barrel. But it was not terribly sweet. Kind of a drying oak, not a rich... Not not a lot of richness, not a lot of viscosity. So I was like, well, bummer. <laughs> that kind of sucks. I was hoping for more. Now, maybe it was just a weird batch, but I've heard many a people say, many a person, many a folk, say that they prefer the Weller 107, which I do love, to Weller 12. So now I'm just like, well, I'll just stay with Weller 107 then, unless at some point I have a taste of Weller 12 that I'm like, oh yeah, no, it's not at all what I remember. But my multiple tastes have led me to believe what I currently do. And that's very disappointing. If I were to land a Weller 12 and it were to taste like that, again, I'd be like, dang it, I knew better. That said, I, I still would buy it at MSRP, but I don't think I'll ever see it at MSRP. Never have. Don't think I ever will. My brother did, so he's got a bottle, unopened at this point, that I will taste when I go to Texas, probably, uh, in December. And so I may come back and eat my words. I'd be happy to do that. Um, wouldn't be the first time. But not yet. Not yet. The very last disappointing bottle I'll mention today, again, it's not a bad one, but what could it have been? And that's Little Book Batch 3. And I think the Little Book line in general is kind of disappointing. A lot of weird stuff in there. But Batch 3, it was nothing weird. It was all barrel-proof, well-aged Jim Beam products. So they were calling it, you know... It, it was. It's got Booker, well-aged Booker's in it. It's got well-aged Basil Hayden's. It's got Baker's. It's got Knob. All at barrel strength. All at ages kind of above average. So I'm like, yeah, friggin' sign me up, dude. That sounds fantastic. 
and it was fine. Like I was expecting this big, rich again. Like what well, you think well-aged products at Barrel Proof? You're thinking really fantastic tactile sensations in your mouth hole. You're thinking nice syrupy sweetness. Um, you're thinking sweet oak. And again, it was just drying and spicy. It was spicy and drying, which if that's what you're into, fantastic. I know Breaking Bourbon gave this particular bottle really, really high marks, but I just didn't get that out of it. I was pretty disappointed in that release, given the specs. The specs were fantastic. And if they release something with similar specs, I'd be like, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it again. I'm no doubt about it. I'm ready to get hurt again. Uh, but that one was like, oh, bummer. Like I think that could have been really wonderful and phenomenal. But I think all those slightly above average age barrels were kind of rejects from <laughs> maybe from their home bases, you know. And so they got aged a little bit longer, and then um, maybe Freddie is like, well, these are fine. So let's blend them together, and then it created a fine whiskey that cost above 100 bucks. That was fine. All right, squad. Like I said, some safe safe throws out there that probably you agree with. Maybe some ones you're like, dude, you're freaking insane. Well, yeah, I mean, probably a little bit. Um, but that's my take. So tell me what you agree with. Tell me what you disagree with. Tell me what your most disappointing whiskeys were ever in the comments below. I would want to know what you think for sure. But at the very least, I hope you had fun. I had fun making this for you, as I always do. It's very enjoyable talking into the camera and drinking bourbon periodically, most of the time on a Saturday night. There are worse things I could be doing. All right, everybody, that's going to do it. Don't forget to tune in Thursday, 8 o'clock, for live streams with me and Brian. Abandoned bourbon, lots of fun. And I'll see you again on the Droopy Whiskey Show next Monday. Till then, stay healthy, stay safe, and remember to keep it neat.